heart of where innovation, money, and power collide in Silicon Valley and beyond. This is Bloomberg Technology with Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow. Caroline Hyde at Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York. And I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, Bitcoin tops $30,000. We'll discuss what's driving the gains, the assets getting a boost on those moves. Plus, we'll take a deep dive into one of the biggest U.S. intelligence leaks in recent history. More details on the breach ahead. And we'll be all across the race for artificial intelligence dominance. Capital G announces a $100 million funding round for an AI research platform, AlphaSense. But first, let's check in on these public markets. Because actually, tech is feeling a little less love than the rest of the benchmarks today. We're up by four tenths percent on the Nasdaq. All important data point. You heard it from Alex Guy just earlier. The CPI print tomorrow. A little bit of nervousness, therefore, around owning big tech. Some of the key tech names Ed will drill into a little bit later. But all country world index, interestingly, on the higher side. Europe came back after the Easter holiday, the extended break, and managed to put a little bit of fuel under that fire. Two-year yield, though, just rises up some five basis points as we all attention on CPI and what it means for the Federal Reserve. Move it on. What's happening in terms of crypto? $30,000, well above now. We managed to break free of that trading range, Ed. The 28000 we were generally languishing around for the past few weeks. And what does it mean? Some really psychological levels being hit now. Are we going back to eclipsing the prices where we saw the three arrows capital disintegration, where you saw Terra Luna right. debacle? We're now up 7% over the last two days. Yeah, the big question is still why, but the what is playing out in equity markets as well. You look at crypto-related stocks, we're markedly higher in a number of names. I actually want to go to MicroStrategy because the $4 billion bet that it made on Bitcoin, that company is now back in the black because Bitcoin is trading above the average transaction price. There's so much out there today about, well, what happens if the Fed brings rates back down? What does that mean for Bitcoin? What happens if we enter a recession? Then you look at the relative performance of Bitcoin to other, uh, I guess, risk assets, you know, in terms of the best performers of the year. Yeah. I still don't have a great sense on what is happening. Luckily, we've got a couple of guests who are going to be perfectly placed to discuss it all, as well as the ETH upgrade as soon as tomorrow. Bloomberg's Katie Greifeld kicks us off. Katie, what are you seeing around the world of crypto at the moment? What are you? There are so many narratives as to what could be pushing Bitcoin higher in particular. There's a lot of narratives. There's no satisfying answer other than the one that this is a macro asset. It tends to follow sort of the macro narrative uh, that's of the day and of the day of the past few weeks. The narrative has been that the Fed is going to be forced to cut rates at some point this year. This, that would obviously be good news for the likes of tech, for the likes of crypto. When you think about that low interest rate environment that really pushed investors out the risk spectrum. What's been interesting over the past few days is that you've seen Bitcoin sort of break apart from tech. Today is a great example. You have Bitcoin up, what, almost 4%. Then you look at the Nasdaq 100 down about half a percent or so. So maybe those correlations coming apart a bit to the benefit of Bitcoin. I would say, though, that liquidity in this space is yeah. still very, very low despite this rebound. I think it's also a question of who is in this market, who is buying, right? We're at the 30,000 US dollar per token mark for the first time since June of last year but still significantly far from the November 2021 high. Mm -hmm. What are the big forces in terms of institutions, names driving this market, Katie? None to speak of, really. And that's part of the reason why you have liquidity so low right now. According to some measures, Bitcoin liquidity hovering near a 10-month low. You haven't really seen a big institutional push with this rebound. And if you look at some of the retail flows, I like to track exchange-traded products both in the U.S. and Europe. You really haven't seen any meaningful inflows to speak of. So the tourists are gone from this market. The institutions are gone for, from this market. You're left with sort of the crypto believers who are pushing the price higher, again, in very low liquidity, which has helped to the upside. But if we get some sort of upset, perhaps in the form of a more hawkish Fed than expected, that low liquidity could exacerbate things to the downside as well. All right, Bloomberg's Katie Greifeld, thank you very much. Welcome now, Spencer Bogut, Blockchain Capital General Partner here with me in San Francisco. You are essentially a fundamental investment analyst. You lead research. 
what do the fundamentals tell you about what on earth is happening with Bitcoin right now? So most of the fundamentals that we deal with are early stage startups. I should startups, also say, but which fundamentals? Yeah. Are there yeah. any fundamentals you can point right. to? So most of the fundamentals we work with for early stage startups are related to all the things you'd see in any traditional software startup. Right? We're looking at user growth. We're looking at, at transaction activity, depending on the particular company. Now, here for Bitcoin, when we're trying to describe or explain the price action, we always want to come back to one reason. But the reality is that there's a wide variety of market participants in crypto. And so I think that there's myriad factors at play simultaneously. You already touched on a few of those, but one of them is the lingering inflation concern. Well, here's the thing. I want to channel my inner Katie Greifeld. Sure. Because she lives Bitcoin second yeah. by second. Yeah. And she basically points out no earnings, no cash flow, no underlying business for sure. you to analyze. You actually just pointed out the opposite. Those are exactly the sort of criteria you're looking at when assessing Bitcoin's push higher. Sure. So, I mean, for a lot of people looking at this, I think they're seeing there, there's still some concerns about inflation. So the idea of a scarce asset with a fixed supply has appeal. Uh, there's still some lingering banking concerns, even though the, the peak of the concerns have died down. But that increases demand for an asset that people can securely self-custody as owners. Right, so those are two of maybe the four reasons I'd say that are that are driving Bitcoin higher. Hey, Caro, in the technology sector, whether it's equities, whether it's crypto, if in doubt, go back to inflation in the Fed. <laughs> I mean, that was always the argument. Was it an inflation hedge? That didn't seem to bear out from the numbers when we saw inflation, Spencer. But we do see it more of a buffeted about by the Federal Reserve and risk tolerance. What about institutional players? We were talking to Katie about that. Are they starting to be tempted to come and back in when we see a 30,000 level? Absolutely. I think for the institutional players, I mean, listen, we run a venture capital fund that invests in early stage companies. A lot of our limited partners in our fund are large institutional allocators, endowments and pension funds. And an increasing number of them own crypto directly, primarily Bitcoin and or Ether. But then they also want additional exposure via venture capital funds that are invested in the space. So there is absolutely an appetite from them. But overall, I would say that most of them allocated over the past couple of years and have not been adding more recently. Go to ETH for us, because we are looking towards what is the continuation of the upgrade to more of a proof of stake concept. We're having the Shanghai upgrade tomorrow. In layman's terms, what does that mean? Do you expect there to be more volatility around the space? I don't expect a lot of volatility, but in layman's terms, what's going on here is that the way that the Ethereum network is secured is by people providing or staking their capital, their Ether, into the protocol itself. They are rewarded for doing so financially, and what happens tomorrow is people are now able to withdraw the Ether that they have staked. So this only started a little over a year ago um, when we had the merge that proof of stake really came into, into being. And now what we're about to see is that people can withdraw the assets that they have staked. That said, from our conversations around the market, we're not seeing a lot of demand for people to unstake their assets. So we mostly think that this will be a non-event tomorrow. Yeah, Spencer, many have been saying it feels as though the players who stake their ETH, they're long-term committed to the space. But Ed, whether or not venture capital remains long-term committed to the space amid some of the debacles of last year, that's still the key question, yes. particularly as they, you know, are much more nervous to write checks. Yeah, and that's where I would go to Spencer next, because we've been distracted by artificial intelligence. We've looked at volatility. I mean, as an asset class, Bitcoin still carries a lot of volatility, Spencer. The root of my question is, have any of the sort of psychological drivers in this market changed so far in 2023 when you think about the SVB fallout? Or has the crypto community kind of just got on with it? Mostly people have just gotten on with it, right? I mean, there are some new headwinds, I think, from FTX collapse that is presenting regulatory headwinds. Right. But overall, the industry is just pushing forward. It is much more organized than it has been historically, at least in terms of tackling some of these, these regulatory and political issues. Um, so overall, what we're seeing is for venture capital firms, they're following the talent. And they're watching that there continues to be a flow of high-quality talent into crypto companies and crypto markets. Spencer, you just mentioned there, though, that you got on with it amid the collapse of Signature, of Silver, like, uh, uh, Silvergate. I'm interested in the banking rails, though, and how much that has impacted liquidity. It's certainly been an impact. I mean, several of the largest banks that were servicing crypto companies provided critical infrastructure for all of those companies to be able to exchange capital on a 24-7 basis. 
That's particularly important for crypto markets that operate 24-7, 365. Now some of those banks have been put out of business, and there is an, an open opportunity for someone to recreate the infrastructure that previously existed. All right, Spencer Boga of Blockchain Capital with Bitcoin at around $30,259 per token. All right, Caroline. Yeah, Ed, let's turn now for a moment to some sad news we've been covering out of Silicon Valley. Katie Cotton, longtime Apple communications chief, has died. Cotton was named Apple's vice president of communications all the way back in 1996, helping really craft the company's media strategy, help orchestrate those groundbreaking launch events. She worked behind the scenes as a champion of Apple's brand and famously protected jobs through his own health decline. Katie Cotton passed away peacefully last week. The U.S. is facing tough questions from allies after a trove of classified documents were leaked online to the global public. Former U.S. National Security Advisor, that's John Bolton, spoke about the leak earlier on Bloomberg Surveillance. Take a listen. I would also caution at this point that we not draw too many conclusions. Uh, that This could be uh, an influence operation by somebody we don't know who. And once you get into the world of counterintelligence, uh, it makes uh, being in a hall of mirrors look easy. It's very complicated. Let's try and break down some of the complexities with our own Nick Wadhams. He's Bloomberg News National Security Editor. Just how big a trove of information is this, Nick? Well, it's pretty darn big, and uh, it really confirms in a lot of ways what we had known and what U.S. officials had been telling us publicly about what their really biggest fears are. And the big one there is Ukraine, and specifically the possibility that Ukraine will run out of ammunition in the fight against Russia, both artillery shells, but also air defenses. Uh, so it, what, what it seems to be we're really peeling back the veneer a bit and getting into the real nitty gritty of just how worried U.S. officials are about how Ukraine is going to be able to defend itself against Russia. Nick, when we look over history at leaks of this kind, the questions quickly become where the documents originated from and their authenticity, right? What have officials had to say mm. about that? Well, this is really the big question uh, that we're all trying to figure out. So how authentic are they and in what ways were these documents p potentially manipulated? You had John Bolton on saying, you know, could, this could have been a, a counterintelligence operation itself. And, you know, so there is a, a big question about how authentic these documents are and uh, what the reason was for their leak. So if this is someone on the inside saying this has to get out to expose what's really going on behind the scenes, well, that's one thing, sort of an Edward Snowden Chelsea Manning type of situation, or if this is Russia that got those documents and then manipulated some of the numbers in there uh, to create a false impression. You know, I mean, this yeah. is, again, that hall of mirrors that John Bolton referenced. Nick, so actually, when we're sitting here as technology consumers of information, is this a cyber threat and hack? Or actually, is when will we understand whether this is something that the U.S. could have protected? <laughs> Well, it's a great question because it's, it's going to, again, run us up against what uh, U.S. officials tell us and what, may, what the truth may actually be. So we know there is an investigation going on right now. The, the big question will be, OK, it, was this a leak? Was this someone on the inside who got this out? Was this a hack? Was this some sort of counterintelligence operation? There, there's so much we don't know and so much likely they're not going to tell us because to tell us what exactly happened here is in turn going to expose U.S. sources and methods. So we're still trying to sift through all of that stuff. My suspicion is, uh, given the gravity of this and what U.S. officials have been willing to say about how grave this leak is, that it was in fact a leak or a hack and not uh, some sort of uh, influence operation. All right, our thanks to Bloomberg. Nick Wadhams out of DC on Bloomberg Technology here. Now, over in the UK, MI5, which is Britain's domestic intelligence service, is appointing its first female head of its cyber spying agency, GCHQ. Anne Keast Butler, the current deputy director general, will take up her new post in May. The change in leadership comes at a pretty sensitive time as the US and its allies, as we've just discussed, continue to deal with the fallout of a series of intelligence leaks that have emerged online in recent days. 
She will replace the outgoing director, Sir Jeremy Fleming, who's held that position for the last six years. Caroline. Let's stick with cyber security for a moment, Ed, because we're going to look at shares of Akamai right now. After being upgraded by Piper Sandler to overweight, managing to tick up 2.5%, the analysts citing a recent pullback in shares, look offering an opportunity to get into the stock as the company is likely to refocus its profit strategy. And speaking of some analyst calls, look at NASDAQ, the company, NASDAQ Inc. The shares of, you know, the stock exchange operator is downgraded to equal weight from overweight over at Morgan Stanley. The analyst sees risks to growth for the outlook of NASDAQ Solutions. It's the business that makes up actually 70% of the company's revenue. Nevertheless, trading flat on the day. Coming up, ever wonder how banks stack up when it comes to, well, how they use artificial intelligence? We'll speak with Evident CEO about well, the firm's recent report analyzing AI in financial services. Even got a shout out from the one and only Jamie Dimon. This is Bloomberg. This is a incredibly disruptive new technology. I think we're seeing opportunity and potential platform shift that we haven't seen in a long time. Regulation can put us where we need to be if we have the, the strength to put it in place. I do think it's just impossible to regulate. All of the leading AI labs know they're creating something dangerous, but none of them really want to stop it. The way that Chinese companies go about the AI space is different. They just don't have the same approach toward uh, the morality around these technologies that we do in the U.S. The impact on jobs is real, but it doesn't have a super intelligence that will have a mind of its own. It's on all of us, and particularly investors, to think about the questions and the um, potential falls, you know, as well as all the opportunity and value it creates. The debates are still clear. Our previous guests there weighing in on what are the risks, what are the opportunities that come when using particularly generative AI in various sectors. How will AI reshape the competitive landscape? In particular, we're going to focus in on banking right now to help answer that question. Alexandra Muzavizade, she is the CEO and co-founder of Evident, which tracks AI integration in financial services. Alexandra, you got a bit of a shout out in JP Morgan's annual letter, Jamie Dimon's in particular. What is it that you're doing? How are you measuring what AI is being adopted by banks? So we uh, published um, about eight weeks ago the first public benchmark on AI adoption for banks. And what we do, it has not been done before in terms of taking uh, outside in view, i.e. holding a mirror up to the banks uh, and looking at their AI capabilities. So what we do is that we, um, we go and we measure the banks on their, the strength of their AI ecosystem, and then we rank them according to um, the scores that they get against the strengths of this ecosystem, which yeah. we break down into four areas, talent, innovation, leadership, and responsible AI. Okay, so talent, bringing on the right people, the right parts of the banks you need to build up. What about responsible AI? What are banks doing about that at the moment? Yeah, it is. Uh, I mean, on the, on the talent and the leadership and innovation side, that's sort of really in the engine room. You know, have you got the right talent, um, AI, you know, dev ops and ML ops, and you would look at implementation talent and so on. Um, and on the innovation is whether you're sort of following a build or buy approach, whether you're looking at um, research and patents or what sort of partnerships you have. Um, also what you're investing in or acquiring. Mm. But on the, um, doing all that is great, right? Looking at the raw horsepower, but doing it in a responsible manner is, is really critical. And especially now given um, the release of ChatGPT and a lot of banks and lots of other sectors too, but banks looking at how to incorporate large language models. The responsible AI bit is, is, is really important in terms of making sure that your clients, customers, um, uh, are comfortable yeah. with the handling of all of this data and with the use of AI tools on that data. And it's right. really important to show that you're following frameworks of responsible and ethical AI as you use it. You know, Alexandra, I, I appreciate the depth of the methodology. You know, in recent weeks, Caroline and I have name-checked a number of banking CEOs. Brian Moynihan, first week of March, was talking about how they're dabbling, there's work to do. 
when it comes to modernizing banking technology with regards to AI. So who are the winners and losers on your index? Who scores highly? Who scores poorly? Yeah, well, we have, as you know, we have JP Morgan uh, topped the index, came out number, number one in the index. Um, interestingly, uh, Royal Bank of Canada came second, a smaller bank. Um, and, but predominantly, we're seeing the uh, North American banks in the top 10 with the European banks um, lagging somewhat yes. and, the, and the UK banks um, lagging the European banks. That brings me to my next question, which is we learned in the aftermath of Silicon Valley Bank or relearned how global the banking industry is. How close is the coordination that you see between different geographies and regions in the banking system on how to implement AI across borders? Well, um, there's, there's no real coordination between the banks across. The way that implementation is happening in the European banks is quite different from the way that it's being done in the Northern, um, North American banks. The North American banks take an approach um, much more looking at how big tech is organized, so having R&D centers and being uh, much using AI across the banks, whereas European banks take more of an engineering approach where they're going in silos and implementing AI um, more in a siloed approach. So you do see differences in the approaches that the banks are taking whether you be in, in Europe or, or North America. And Alexandra, does any of that come down to how governments or cross institutional viewpoints are of how to regulate, how to ethically build AI? Because many would say, actually, when you think of the regulation being developed around it, actually Asia or indeed Europe really leaves the pack in this way. Yes, I mean, the, the, um, the, the, the interesting aspect here is actually that the, the North American and Canadian banks were very visible around the, um, the guardrails that they're putting in place and, and now we have to remember that banks are heavily regulated yeah. to begin with so a lot of this is happening internally what um, what we're capturing is what is expressed externally in terms of uh, you know uh, principles around explainability responsible AI in general and the people they're putting in place and the lines of defense across the banks that they're visible about in Europe, you've got GDPR uh, regulation, right? Yeah. And so there's a different, that sits slightly differently in the banks and they're expressing the guardrails that they're putting around it in slightly different ways. Yeah. But you could say that the, there are um, advanced thinking at the European level with the AI Act in, in motion right now. Mm. Um, but because of the GDPR um, regulation in place, there is uh, there's a lot of thinking that has been done in the European banking system. Great to have some time with you. We thank you, Alexandra. Thank you. Day, CEO and co-founder of Evident. Ed, to you. Yep. Coming up, Alphabet actually doubling down on its own generative AI ambitions, but through its investment arm, Capital G. We speak to the CEO of AlphaSense, which just did a $100 million extension round led by Capital G. More on that next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Caroline Hyde in New York. And I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. Let's just quickly check in on these markets because we had seen broadly technology stocks in the US under pressure. We still remain NASDAQ 100, the big benchmark that, remember, is up about 90% so far this year, down half a percent, six out of seven days trading that is on the lower side. The FANG index, this is about big tech getting sold off today. The Microsoft, the Alphabets, we see across the board just under pressure as we worry about that CPI, that inflation print tomorrow. Bitcoin, though, shrugging off any of the risk asset concerns, up another 3% as we hit some key technical levels, 30,000. Switch it on. Let's go micro for a moment. Individual movers. Microsoft getting a bit of an analyst concern coming from UBS, saying that maybe Azure is going to be more under pressure amid these economic headwinds that we see. And actually, you see a lot of these cloud companies on the downside today, Snowflake and Datadog. Alibaba off by 1.4%. Keep a close eye, eye on Baba because plenty of news have come out overnight in terms of its own AI cheap Jack GBT like service being integrated across its products. We'll have more on that in a moment. Virgin Orbit, look, I mean, a penny stock now, 31% lower as it filed for bankruptcy, and the NASDAQ says, look, they're going to have to delist this stock, Ed. Yep, big driver in that market being AI as well. And the race in AI 
continues to heat up. Alphabet doubling down on its own generative AI ambitions, but this time by investing in the startup world. Capital G, which is Alphabet's venture arm, announced a $100 million funding round that it led into B2B research platform AlphaSense. That brings AlphaSense's valuation to $1.8 billion. And the company's CEO, co-founder, Jack Coco, joins us now. Jack, this is interesting. It's an extension of a round you did last summer. Why? Why did you need these additional funds? Well, Ed, um, great question, and thanks for having me. Um, we weren't actually looking for financing, but we had been talking to Capital G for several years. We certainly viewed them as an amazing potential investor for us, and uh, we just uh, had a catch-up conversation a few months ago, and uh, uh, that led to a quick meeting of the minds, and while we didn't need the capital, we weren't looking for the capital, uh, it was uh, such an opportunity that we, we didn't want to pass it up. Caroline, I find this incredibly interesting in this environment. Essentially, a flat round, uh, interesting some of the other investors, including Goldman Sachs's asset management unit. Yeah, and I think a lot of this comes around a market that is deeply energized by all things AI, yes. generative AI in particular. Jack, what is AlphaSense actually doing? What are you currently providing? So our, our platform is really a, a, a market intelligence and search platform for enterprise customers. It's basically helping these big companies, uh, financial firms and corporations find the right data points and insights to make the big decisions that really matter in their businesses. I and mean, if you think about it, uh, for um, every company, their enterprise, enterprise value is a cumulative sum of the decisions that they make. And we help them make every one of those better by having the right access to um, data points and insights um, so they can make a little bit better decisions more quickly and confidently. Yeah. And this was just really hard to do before. People were control F searching, and still are today out there in the market, uh, PDF documents or searching on the web for critical business insights that drive million dollars, sometimes billion dollar decisions. So really what we're bringing to them is thousands of high value sources in one place where you can search across them really powerfully and find the insights that you can rely on. And you know, that's, that's we've found uh, to be really a, a solution that resonates in the market. More than yeah. half of the uh, you know, Fortune 500 companies are today using this. So yeah. you know, that, that's, uh, that's Google using it, today. Merck, Shell, Bank of America, Raytheon. There is a lot of debate, though, when you're thinking about the data troves that you're using to bring this sort of analysis and to speed up everyone's productivity is how reliable can the data be and how is it ethically being used? How much are you feeding into that sort of conversation right now? That's a really, really important conversation. Um, it's, um, you know, in, in our case, um, we've always built our platform uh, in a way that uh, the, uh, we're sourcing information from really, truly high value content from equity research companies' own disclosures, uh, news media, and you know, expert interviews of people in the trenches and in, in business, um, sharing insights uh, with, uh, with uh, investment analysts and on calls that we transcribe. So it's really high-value business information, so grounding uh, the information that our search engine uh, finds in those high-value uh, sources is really important. And then um, we're able to deliver uh, really uh, the... Uh, the value back to the content providers. Uh, when somebody's content is being used more, they, they also get paid more as a content provider. So mm. it's a really important debate around uh, whether that's happening appropriately with large language models. But as we add uh, language model uh, capabilities on top of this, this high value content, we've kind of built a system in a way that uh, content owners actually get paid as they should. And Ed, it really feels like this debate will run and run, but I like the way in which we're starting to really try and see the application. We keep questioning what layer of AI is going to be the most valuable. Is it well, the infrastructure that sort of Jack is building? Is it the companies that own some of the data troves as well? And as Jack would point out, you know, the inputs for the large language model, the data set you're relying on is important. It leads me to Alphabet, Jack, and Google. You know, Capital G would kind of point out they run independently as the growth venture arm. But I wonder how close this does bring you to Alphabet and to Google, what partnerships you can explore, what advantage from access to data that might give you as you work on your own product. Well, certainly a big part of the motivation of partnering with Capital G is the opportunity to partner with the broader Alphabet umbrella. They have uh, 
a really large portion of the world's AI scientists and developers working for the business. And, and this certainly does give us uh, opportunities to, to partner with them, have conversations with them, and also have conversations with people where we can just uh, advance our, our business and go to market. So uh, that was certainly a big part of the motivation of uh, inviting them in, in as an investor at a moment where we, did, we weren't looking for the capital. Jack, many might then think, oh, they might be a quite useful owner. What is your view, your direction of travel for the business? You want to remain independent, want an IPO? Um, we really see this as a huge market opportunity. And we're building this with, uh, with the time scale of uh, the next 10 years, 20 years. And um, to gain the resources to really build the kind of company that we're, we're building, we see IPO as an inevitable step along the way. So that's the path that, that we're on. I'm sure the 100 million satisfies you for the time being, though, Jack. It's great to have some time with you, Jack Coco, the CEO of AlphaSense there. Ed, you got some more tech news? Yeah, time now for talking tech. Billionaire twins Tyler and Cameron Winklevoss made a $100 million loan to support their crypto exchange, Gemini. This comes after Gemini had sought funding from outside investors in recent months but didn't come to any agreement. That, according to sources. Elizabeth Holmes has to report to prison as scheduled later this month after a judge rejected her request to remain free on bail as she appeals a fraud conviction. And finally, Twitter has stopped being an independent company after merging with the newly formed shell firm called X Corp. It's unclear what the change means for Twitter, though Elon Musk has in the past suggested that Twitter could lead to X, which he dubbed as an everything app. Caroline. Oh, let's stick on Elon Musk. Well, let's stick on things he owns because for a moment we also want to think about where he's taking his other company Tesla in fact we saw shares of Tesla sort of in an interesting move today we're up about a percentage point coming off of those highs a new proposal we understand federal class action suit against the company says Tesla employees viewed and shared videos and images of car owners in violation with its privacy promises and of California state laws and the state constitution. Tesla has not responded immediately to a request for comment, but we are coming off of those highs that we got a little bit earlier. Coming up, let's talk about investing even more in cybersecurity. What a hot topic on the day and what kind of new risks are there to be considered at the moment, particularly with the raise and rise and rise of AI. More on that with Ballistic Ventures. by Mac Mefta. That's next. This is Bloomberg. Continuing to talk about cybersecurity, the space, of course, booming over the last few years. Just think about the focus that we had during the pandemic. Just think about today's news flow as we worry that maybe the leaked documents that pose a serious national security threat to the United States, according to the Pentagon, is that in some way related to a hack or cyber attack? Let's talk about where you can invest as well. Is it the right time to be investing in all these sorts of companies? So we can turn to our next guest who perhaps has a bit of skin in the game. Parmak Mefta is with us. Insight on today's VC Spotlight. He's co-founder, general partner over at Ballistic Ventures. And Parmak, you have a life dedication to cyber, in particular working over at AT&T for years. What now are you seeing in smaller companies, areas that you can invest in making sure that the cyber threats can be defeated? Yeah, thank you very much for having me, guys, by the way. Um, let's see. Um, one of the great things about cybersecurity that we've enjoyed is... Uh, it's very resilient to economic upturns and downturns. So, um, in fact, if you take a look at a couple of the CIOs surveys that, that have come up, cyber is one of the areas that is actually increasing in spend during economic downturns because everybody's worried about risk. Um, that's kind of one thread, which is which always makes cyber very very exciting as an investment vehicle. The other thread is these uh, threats are ever evolving. So. The adversaries don't sit still. They're constantly inventing new threat vectors. And as a result, some of the old security controls have to be reinvented on a constant basis. And of course, with the emerging new threats, there has to be new innovative companies that are going to emerge to counteract those threats. So as a result, uh, from a startup perspective, venture perspective is a very interesting area to invest in. Um, I would argue with the current economic downturn, if you look at uh, some of the public equities today, as well, and if you took a look at some of the multiples of revenues, multiples of EBITDA, it'll make cyber very, very exciting to invest in. So, um, you know, uh, we like the sector quite a bit, of course. 
Well, Mac, we're interested in where the dollars and the energy is coming from. When I was at CES in January, which seems like a lifetime ago now, <laughs> uh, Jen Easterly, the director of its CISA, basically made an appeal to corporate America saying, do more, invest earlier in cybersecurity, integrate cybersecurity tools at the moment you design a new product or piece of software. Is that where the energy is coming from in the form of your LPs? I'm just curious who's backing you to make these investments. Yeah, absolutely. So I think one of the things Jen pointed out and you're pointing out, which is probably the most important thing in cyber is cyber has always been thought of as an afterthought. Um, if you take a look at the applications, for instance, applications are developed without security in mind during the software development life cycle. And we're seeing a shift happening, especially over the last 10, 15 years. Um, there's an area called shift left, you, pro you probably have heard, which is equipping software developers so they can build security into the fabric of the application during the assembly process of the application. It's one of the only areas that you can build a critical asset and think of security as an afterthought. It's incredibly inefficient. So to Jen's point, you know, uh, software security, especially and security in general, has to be thought of during the assembly process of any artifact. Um, it's certainly one theme or one area that we see. There are many other themes that uh, we're investing in. Uh, when we look at our LP base, um, they kind of share the same excitement and enthusiasm. You know, they, they view cyber as very resilient to economic upturns and downturns. We're focused in the early stages of investing, and I would argue during economic downturns is a really good time to create companies and hope you can catch the upturn cycle when, when the equity capital markets come back. And so the LPs share that enthusiasm. They think the stage of our investing is pretty exciting. They right. It's pretty exciting. I and that's why they hey, Barmak, we're looking at your portfolio companies here. Concentrics, one name that jumps out. How yeah. is artificial intelligence impacting how you invest? Yeah, definitely. So um, I would argue a couple of areas. One, AI has made um, the business of uh, threat detection, incident response a lot more automated. In the case of Concentric, they focus on data security. So what they go after is they look at unstructured data that passes through your organization, either through your Slack channels, Office 365, Confluent, and uh, there's an inadvertent risk exposure of that unstructured data to the outside world. Um, without artificial intelligence, identifying that unstructured data and the risk exposure is almost impossible. And um, so you can apply AI to areas of data access and governance, you can apply AI to automating threat detection incident response, and removing the scarce human capital resources that are available so they can focus on higher important things. Um, having said that though, you can't rely on AI to completely automate your business. There's a lot of business context mm. that goes into understanding whether you're a financial services company or an insurance company or a healthcare company. So it can take you 80% there, 85% there. The last 10 to 15%, it still requires some human touch to sort of apply the business context to what you're trying to go after. You mentioned varied industries that deploy cyber needs. What about the companies building all of this, Bamak? Are you investing primarily in American-built companies? Is this truly global? It, you know, from a cyber perspective, I still argue the epicenter for a lot of innovation is here in, in America. I would say Israel has, has sort of come up over the last five to seven years as a new epicenter. There's a lot of innovation that comes out of Israel, partly out of Unit 8200, which is part of the IDF. Um, and uh, so the vast majority you see between those two areas, um, EMEA and EU specifically is, is obviously coming together in the last three to five years. My previous company, Alien Vault, was a company that was started out of Spain and had moved their headquarters to the U.S. So, but, but I would say America and Israel are kind of the two main epicenters. All right. Barmak Mefta, co-founder, general partner at Ballistic Ventures. Thank you. You take two themes, Caroline cybersecurity, and then you match it with the other big theme, AI. So let's stick with AI. In China, the government plans to require a security review of chat GPT like bots. Providers of the generative artificial intelligence services must ensure content is accurate and neither discriminates nor endangers security. Chinese companies from Alibaba to SenseTime to Baidu all want to build the definitive next-gen AI platform. Karen. Yeah, and maybe this regulation comes thick and fast as big Chinese companies are still evolving in their generative AI products. We know that the large language log model dubbed, well, I'm not, I'm going to butcher the name, I'm afraid, but Tongyi Quinwen. Tongyi Chenwen. There yeah. we are, Chenwen. 
to my rescue, Ed. Basically, it's roughly translated as truth from a thousand questions. This is being incorporated across Alibaba's products at the moment, but they've also got AI models that are having some sort of like Amazon Echo-like smart speakers. We've also got a Slack-like app, but we've also got news on Alibaba and its IPOs of various units. Meanwhile, coming up, so much more other than Alibaba, currently off by 1.5% in US trading. We'll be discussing all things global in the US gaming trends. Convoy Ventures is on next. This is Bloomberg. Gaming venture capital funding has returned to pre-2021 levels. That's according to Convoy Ventures' latest gaming report for the first quarter of this year. Out today, co-founder and managing partner Jason Chapman with us to go over the numbers. It's interesting. We're kind of back to this pre-2021 level. But if you look at the quarter just gone, a quarter-on-quarter -quarter bump in, in venture dollars deployed, but nothing like the quarters that we did see in 2021. What's the main driver right now for backing startups in this industry? Yeah, I think I think generally, and thank you for having me, is largely the the player data. You know, we look and see that 30.2 billion people across the world continue to play video games. That's nearly 40 percent of the global population. And this quarter, we saw about 761 million dollars invested into gaming deals across venture. That is up 29 percent. And so, I think generally, you see investors flock to areas that prove to be resilient during economic difficulties, which. Gaming has proven during the last two recessions to do so. And during this, this current phase, we expect it will do the same. You, of course, often invest in the infrastructure around gaming. What about the building, the making of gaming and games themselves and how they're being offered? Because a lot of them are more streaming services now. Yeah, so I mean, there's a, there's a lot there. I mean, actually talking about streaming, it's, it's ironic given that Google Stadia just closed officially this, this actually this quarter in January. Um, you know, we are very excited to back the, the infrastructure of how you deliver games, how you distribute games, how you advertise games. Um, building a game is extremely expensive. You know, looking at AAA content, it often is north of $80 million to actually produce. And so for us, we think the upside is definitely in the, in the, con uh, in the technologies versus the content. Interesting. So given Stadia, you just mentioned it, do we think there's less desire by some very well capitalized big tech public companies to invest in content at this moment? We're seeing a lot of content funding uh, to date, um, a lot of excitement around content because, you know, as as we are seeing, Hogwarts legacy has, has caught the world by storm. And hopefully you have some players there actually at Bloomberg. Um, you know, with content, it's incredibly <laughs> scalable and it can be delivered uh, at ease to the masses. And something that is very luring about this is that if you find a hit, you find a huge hit. Um, for us, uh, we are much more comfortable as a firm backing the, the things that make delivery of content possible. So we're betting on a category versus one piece of, of content. Right. Uh, we think right. it's a, a more prudent way to approach, approach the industry. You're, you're a completely sector-focused VC fund. There is a big player yes. in this industry right now, which is Saudi Arabia. You look at the savvy Scopely deal as one example, but also the fund, the war chest they've amassed. What's your take on Saudi coming in to sort of dominate this sector? Yeah, so, you know, the, the $38 billion that have been earmarked for gaming is a significant move. Uh, so... Uh, historically speaking, they have not been very active in entertainment, but the government of Saudi Arabia has determined that gaming will be a pillar of entertainment uh, for them going forward. And the acquisition of Scopely, a $4.9 billion acquisition, is a huge win to for the, the Scopely and Savvy team. Uh, so the whole Convoy team is extremely excited about this partnership. Uh, the Savvy yeah. group, with that acquisition, have brought in $100 million monthly actives across their platform, which is a massive deal in the gaming industry and a massive deal for the Savvy platform. Yeah. Hey, Jason, real quick, 2022 was all about online and multiplayer. What's 2023 going to be about? 2023 is going to be the year of uh, user-generated content and the wars between Roblox and Fortnite. Uh, looking at uh, the creator platform just launched and announced by Tim Sweeney a couple weeks ago, uh, you're going to see a lot of creators be lured to that platform from Roblox as well as others. And so we're very keen to watch this, and it's a trend that Convoy is paying a lot of attention right. to and also deploying a lot of money towards. That's bringing your trends as you see them, Convoy Ventures. Co-founder and managing partner Jason Chapman there. Meanwhile, Ed, that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology.
Yeah, real emphasis on cybersecurity and AI in the market right now. Recap with the podcast. You can find it on the terminal, on Apple, Spotify, iHeart, wherever you get your podcasts. Caroline, I think, think about these markets as well. We're bracing for Wednesday. We're bracing for data. And in the technology sector, we're always looking at the Fed. From SF in New York, this is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.